This is Wales' biggest conversation. The BBC Radio Wales phone in with Jason Mahalis. Kayleigh, thank you very much indeed. When the first national memorial dedicated to more than 50,000 fallen personnel from World War II's Bomber Command was unveiled in London a couple of months ago, the controversy surrounding the tactics deployed by Arthur Bomber Harris, Commander-in-Chief of RAF Bomber Command from 42 to 45, was the subject of heated debate on this programme. I don't know if you remember, but Ted Davis from Cardiff got in touch as a caller to tell us he survived 30 missions as a rear gunner aboard a Lancaster bomber. Such was his extraordinary story of courage and friendship in times of incredible danger. We just had to invite him onto the programme to share it with us and to also take your calls. 03700 100 110 then, if you want to talk to Ted Davis. Ted, good, good afternoon to you. Very nice to see you. Thank you, Jason. Nice to be here. It's a real pleasure to welcome you to the programme. Before we hear from Ted, let's hear for a moment some archive of a real bombing raid. This was our very own Winford Vaughan Thomas. He sounds a bit strange because he's wearing an oxygen mask. He's in a Lancaster bomber over Germany in 1943. Now and again, as we walk, the flag burst away among them. A bright light winking in among the heavy concentrated beams. They've got every single searchlight you could possibly imagine out there to catch us. They're coming up to them all the time, waiting for it, and in a moment it'll be our turn to pass through them. Hello, Skipper. Hello, Navigator. Half a minute to go. Okay, thanks for my. I think weaving, Ken. Bomb door open. Hello, Bombardier. Okay when you are. Okay, steady. Three. Rise a little bit. Five. Steady. Bomb's going in a minute. Bomb. Right. Two. Three. Bomb's still going. Wow, powerful radio, eh? Winford Vaughan Thomas and a Lancaster bomber over Germany in 1943. So joining us is Ted Davis, who did that for real 30 times when the chances of surviving were only 1 in 10. In fact, you had a better chance of surviving as a frontline infantryman in the trenches of the First World War. The number to call if you want to put a question to Ted is 03 700 100 110. Ted Davis, welcome yeah. to the programme. Thank you. Great to see you. Ted, that piece of audio that we just played, did that bring back memories? Does that bring it all back? Yes, I can remember the actual broadcast. You can remember that broadcast? Yeah. Really? Does it bring it back, though, when you... Oh, it does, that conversation? It does, yes. Yeah. The dangerous part, of course, was going in on the bomb run where you had to fly straight and level and uh, just go through what was coming up. Mm. If you have any questions for Ted, 03700 100 110. Ted, there are so many people who are going to be fascinated by your extraordinary story. They've already started coming in, actually. So <laughs> let's do some of our listeners' questions straight away before I get stuck in. I think you're going to be a very busy boy this afternoon. Good. Lucas, Lucas says, Jason, can you please ask him if he's disappointed that it took so long for a Bomber Command memorial to be established? My grandfathers both flew with Bomber Command, but they died before the memorial was complete. Very sorry to hear that, Lucas. What do you think? It was very controversial. Yes, it, it was about 60 years too late, in my opinion. I mean, Bomber Command, the, the only force that could uh, attack Germany for four years, and yet there is no campaign medal for Bomber Command, the only unit in the British and Commonwealth forces with no campaign medal. Mm. Why do you think it took so long? <sighs> Politics, I think. I honestly think it's politics. I think Churchill got the idea that uh, bombing German cities was wrong mm. in the end. But they started it. Uh, Warsaw, Rotterdam, London, Coventry, you name it, Portsmouth, Cardiff, Swansea. Mm. 
Mm. Old barn. So you think that no successive government would want to endorse a memorial, would want to No, it's taken, it's taken a long time to be recognised. And there are still people who call, call us murderers, which is absolutely wrong. We were doing a job, we were bombed in this country. So what are you going to do, just let them do what they wanted and not return? Ted, you were a rear gunner, yeah. right? In a Lancaster, and you very kindly brought in a model into studio, so we'll talk about the actual fine details in just a moment. When you were bombing Germany, did you think about the people who you were bombing? Not really, because you were actually uh, away from everything. I mean, uh, it's not as if I was a soldier in the front line facing another man. Mm. I mean, I'm, what, 20,000 feet in the air. Yeah. And we dropped the bombs. A specific target, supposed to be. But, of course, these targets were mostly in uh, areas where people were living. So, I mean, people had to die, unfortunately, the same as they did in this country. Mm. It's war. Yeah, it's war. Take me into that Lancaster, then, if you would. We've yeah. got a model here, which I presume you have on display in your home. Yeah. You've also brought in a photograph as well and some medals. We'll talk about that in just a moment. But when did you sign up? Uh, my my medical was on uh, August the 28th, 1942. I was 17 and three quarters. 17 years old, Ted. Yeah, well, you could volunteer for air crew at 17 and a quarter because of the length of the training. You wouldn't be ready until you were 18 and... And officially able to go. Yeah. What I'm fascinated by is that I asked you that question, did you worry about the people who you were bombing, right? No. You were 17 years old. No. No, I was, not, I was 19 when I was actually yeah. bombing. But you're 17 years old when you sign up, right? Yeah. So you're bombing when you're 19. Yeah. What's that? When you stepped aboard that Lancaster bomber with your crew, the adrenaline is absolutely oh, fine. Yeah. You've lost members of the crew as well I have other members of the crew I didn't lose any of my uh, members of my other crew mem other, other crew members other are crews. falling yeah what's that like as you board that Lancaster bomb oh it's a, a bit of an anxious time you know it depends on the target you're given we had a couple of easy targets and when I say easy I say France and uh, Belgium Norway places like that where they were reasonably easy chat targets, just a couple of hours and you're done. Mm. And not actually going far inland or over to Germany itself. But uh, when you get targets like uh, Cologne, Essen, uh, where else? Nuremberg, yeah. things like that, yes, it's rough. Right, OK. I have a picture here. It's wonderful. You're all smiling. This is your crew. So I presume the pilot's taken the photograph. <laughs> yes, yes. Is this in your house right now? Yes. This it's photo, you, is it's this on. hanging in your house? It is indeed. You, you must be very proud. Yeah. You're a very handsome young man there, second to the right there. Thank Lots you. of hair. You don't have as much hair now. <laughs> well, you have more than me anyway. I should have got some. <laughs> so listen, this is you. Talk me through your crew here then. The first guy... Um, on the left, who's um, this guy? On the left, that's, that's the wireless operator. He's Australian, Bill yeah. Hyde. The second one is uh, the navigator, Kevin yeah. Curtin. Do you remember their names? Yeah. Wow. Bill Hyde, Kevin Curtin, Keith um, Yates. Is this Keith? The, the bomb aimer. Yeah. Uh, Sid Munn, the yeah. flight engineer. Yeah. Then there's myself. There's you there. And Roy yeah. Herbert, he's from, uh, or he was from Hereford, yeah. the mid upper gunner. And of course, the pilot is taking the. When was this taken, Ted? Do you know? It's on the back. <laughs> Oh, yes, it is. October oh. the 14th, 1944. Yeah. yeah. That was the raid at Duisburg. Duisburg. That was yeah. the worst period. Yeah. Yeah. It's the worst period. The one thing about this photo, you're all smiling. You're all young men. I don't think anybody listening to this program right now can my understand my bravery. Pilot, my pilot was an old man. He was 34. <laughs> he was 34, was he? He was the experienced head. No, how, did, how did the crew get selected, Ted? Well, we selected ourselves. We all, when we finish our training, we're all shoved into a great hangar. Pilots, navigators, bomb aimers, all, all types. And you just... Uh, you pick your crew. Pick your crew, your own crew. You're not told to say, you'll go with this fella or this fella. You just pick your own crew. So what did you do? 
I saw this guy and he looked a bit older than the uh, young devils, like, you know, and I thought he won't be looking after medals, looking for medals. He's probably married with a family. So I went up to him. I said, you're looking for a gunner? He says, yes. Yeah. So I said, we'll have a little talk and uh, see how we go. And that's how I chose my pilot. That was the best choice you ever made? The best choice I ever made, yeah. Yeah. And, of course, we went then looking for the rest of the crew. What's the atmosphere like in that hangar? Oh, great. No problems. Yeah. Yeah, everybody's quite happy. Tense? No, not in, not in that hangar, no, no. You're just looking around, you talk to somebody. Yeah, I, I like that guy, he's all right. Like wow. You, know, you want to come with us? Yes. Wow. Unbelievable. This yeah. is brilliant. Right, let's go to Jim in Tlatli. I want to talk to you about your medals as well in just a moment. You very kindly brought in. Jim, hello. Hello there. Hi, hi, how are you? Nice to oh, talk to you. Course. I'd like to know, yes. Just before I left the Air Force, I, I was stationed at IDF Connorsby, and as a reward for some charity work I'd done, um, I was offered a, a flight up in a Lancaster. It was a marvellous experience. We were up for about half an hour. I'd been told to dress up well, so I put pullovers and coats and all that, because after that half an hour, I was frozen to death. How did they manage to fly for hours up to Germany and back in? They must have been freezing. Well, in my uh, turret, the rear turret, it was actually open to the elements. Yeah, uh, the rear turret, turret I was in as it happened. Yeah, I had uh, perspex to the side of me, but where I was looking out into the dark or whatever, like, you know, there was not, nothing at all. It was just uh, no, no perspex, no nothing. And that was simply for visibility. So uh, we did, as a rear gunner, I did have an electric suit underneath my uh, flying overalls. But sometimes even that failed and uh, you just froze. <laughs> Not only was it cold, it was very drafty. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> Three of your crew also. You've got my greatest admiration. Thank you. Yeah, fantastic. What a story, eh, Jim? Three of your crew, Ted, were from Australia. Australia. Yeah. The three on the left. So Kay Curtin, the navigator, was from Sydney. Kay yeah. Yates, the bomber aimer, was from Canberra. Canberra, yeah. And W. Hyde, who was the wireless op, from, from Sydney, Sydney, Australia. What yeah. was the wireless op? Sorry? The wireless op. Wireless operator. Yeah. Wireless well, he operated, he was in, uh, in touch with uh, whoever back at headquarters or yeah. whatever. And then you've got Esman, the flight engineer. Yeah, yeah Sid, Sidman, yeah. Yeah, you've got R. Herbert, the mid-upper Ro- gunner. Roy Herbert. Roy, yeah. and then you've got U. E. Davis. That's me. Rear gunner. <laughs> rear gunner, the most dangerous of all positions. Yeah. Yeah. But I was lucky. You were lucky? Yeah. I only saw, in all the 30 flights we did, maybe two, three fighters. But... Uh, that you were very lucky then. Yeah. <clears throat> but when you consider one other thing, I had four machine guns in the back there. Each machine gun had 2,000 rounds of ammunition, belt ammunition. Mm. And when you consider that that uh, gun, or each gun, would fire 600 rounds a minute, you mm. actually had less than three and a half minutes ammunition, maybe for a seven or eight hour flight. Mm. So anything you shot, it had to be very short bursts. Fantastic. We've got so many people who want to talk to you and put their questions to you, Ted. We'll come back to those in just a moment. Let's take some travel with Mark. At the moment, Jason, all clear across the A55, both east and west, on the live Traffic Wales cameras. Again, though, into Wrexham today, cones and restrictions are causing queues on the one-way system for St George's Crescent, causing queues back towards uh, more or less Eagles Meadow on Salop Road. Now, at the moment, problems east between Carmarthen and Crosshands. The A48 is closed between the turning for the National Botanical Gardens of Wales near Llandarog, heading towards the Crosshands roundabout. Uh, this is due to a car fire looking 
Looking at the live traffic wires cameras from the scene, the car fire itself has been extinguished, but at the, for the time being, in any case, uh, the road remains closed. Trap traffic still naturally stuck there, and I'd imagine being diverted off at uh, Llandarach itself to use the old A48 to uh, rejoin the main carriageway at Cross Hands. The M4 on traffic wires cameras is so far so good, and a quick look at public transport at the moment all seems to be running to time. There we are, that's the latest from BBC Radio Wales Travel. Flying high in word, deed and song on the RN programme, Carwin Ellis from Radio Wales Artist of the Week, Colorama, will be reaching the heights by playing live in studio. I'll be finding out how students from Cardiff got on when they went to NASA's Johnson Space Centre to compete in the Space Settlement Design Competition. You know, living up and out there. Roy Noble, 2 until 5, on BBC Radio Wales. This is the phone in on BBC Radio Wales, but it's a very special phone in this afternoon because my special guest today is Ted Davis from Cardiff, who you may remember got in touch with us back in June to tell us he survived 30 missions as a rear gunner aboard a Lancaster bomber. Such was his extraordinary story of courage and friendship in times of incredible danger during World War II. We had to invite him on the programme to share it with us and to take your calls. He's doing a grand job. At the age of 87, earlier I said you were 86, you are 87, 88 in November. That's right. Fantastic. <clears throat> Looking very well for 88, I have to say. Bronwyn is in Barmouth, and she wants to talk to you, Ted. Hello, Bronwyn. Hello. Hi, good afternoon. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. What a wonderful special guest, a real-life war hero here. <laughs> it is, isn't it? I just want to say that my father was a navigator on the Lancaster bomber. Lovely. And that he got bombed down and was a prisoner of war in Germany. Yeah. But he was the only survivor on his plane. And that was because his parachute got caught in a popular tree. Yeah. And and he was survived. Unfortunately, he passed away about 15 years ago. But ah. my mum's um, still around. And she knows a lot more about it than me because dad wouldn't talk about it. Mm. But I just wanted... Nobody really knew what my dad did. Yeah. So I thought this might have been a chance to say how proud we are as a family. I bet you and, are, and you should be, absolutely. You know, yeah, but, but again, people didn't recognise what they did. And yeah. that's really basically what I wanted to say. Putting their lives so, on the line, absolutely, yeah. Bronwyn. And yeah. he was so very young when he went. He met my mum, and he was away then for about three years, I think. And then they got back and they got married, and obviously... Mm-hmm. Children. <laughs> so, Bronwyn, so your, your dad, this is really interesting, isn't it? Your dad didn't talk about what happened to him, but obviously he told his mum the story, but he didn't tell his children. No. No. Is that a familiar story, Ted, that oh. not a lot of uh, the guys uh, on board the command wanted to talk about the experience? Absolutely. I yeah. do talk about it because uh, I'm proud of what I did. I'm proud of what all bomber command airmen did. Mm-hmm. Because it's oh, I worth... don't think it wasn't because he wasn't proud. I think it was just... I'm sure he was. Because of the yeah. pain and suffering and hurt, probably. Yes. And the experience, yeah. yeah. And he heard, um, when you sort of heard things that weren't true and stuff like that, then he would he would say that didn't happen. Well, there's nothing really remarkable about my story. There are 56,000 others who had a more remarkable story. They never came back. And that's, uh, what, 50-odd percent of the uh, the whole air crew in Barclay. Absolutely. It's the scale, Ted, of yeah. Bronwyn. It's the scale. 50,000 well, yeah. fallen yeah. personnel. For 50, 55,000. 55, yeah. yeah. More than 50,000. Yeah. So 55,000, you were one of the lucky ones. Yeah. Mm, and so was my dad. And your dad, too. Eventually. There were 10, After a rough time in the prisoner of war camp, but he did come back. And there were 10,000. There we have. Yeah. That's really all I had to and all the best to the gentleman. And That's very nice to talk to you. Very ten- nice to talk to you. Oh, all right, then. Thank you, thank my you. lovely. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye. 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 That's probably there were also 10,000 prisoners of war. Hmm. There were also about 9,000 that were wounded. I mean, people don't talk about those. No. They mention maybe the 56,000 that died. But prisoners of war, the wounded, no mention. But, Ted, you know, these young men... Your colleagues, friends, no doubt, were being wiped out, obliterated on a daily basis, on a nightly basis. Yeah. Were you not scared? At times. It was frightening, yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. You see the navigator on there, Kevin Curtin, and the second one in? The second one in, yeah, I can see him, Kevin. His twin brother was also a navigator on the on my squadron. Mm-hmm. He, he was, was killed. killed. His twin brother. He was one of those killed. Yeah. And what's that atmosphere like? This may sound like a daft question, but you know, what's the atmosphere like when young men, your mates, your buddies are oh. being wiped out <laughs> on a nightly basis? You wonder if it's going to happen to you. You but you say to yourself, no, it's not going to happen to me, it's going to happen to somebody else. Mm. This is the same thing with most people in the, in the services, I think. Yeah. It won't happen to you. It won't to happen me. to you, yeah. Yeah. Well, we were lucky it didn't happen to us. Bravery. Yeah. What a crew you had, eh? Oh, they were great. Are these guys still alive? No, they're all gone. When I, re- I retired, actually, in 1989, and my wife and I went out to Australia, and we saw all three of the guys there. They've all since uh, passed on. They've all passed on. Yeah. I'm the only survivor now of the crew. It's <laughs> amazing. Uh, Lee in Swansea says, um, Jace, can you ask the gentleman what he thinks of the misuse of the term hero? It's misused so many times these days. Totally destroys its true meaning. Are you comfortable with being described? I described you as a real-life war hero. I'm not, I'm not a war hero. The war heroes are the guys that didn't come back. They're the heroes. I survived. I'm fortunate. I haven't seen a doctor for 18 years. There's nothing wrong with me. Look at you. (laughs) Look at you. I thought you might be expecting somebody on a Zimmer frame (laughs) in a wheelchair. (laughs) Look at you. Also, I should tell the listeners as well that uh, this is perhaps one of the only opportunities where two Ely boys are talking to each other as well, because you live in Ely, don't you? I do indeed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's very proud. I lived in Ely since... uh, 90, well, 1950, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Listen, I, I just want to ask you, before we go to our next callers, you brought your medals in as well? Yeah. Okay, so what am I looking at here? Well, well you're only looking at... medals. Yeah, you're only looking at uh, virtually general medals. 1939-45 star. Yeah. France and Germany star. Yeah. Air Crew Europe. Europe. Yeah. And the General Service War Medal. General Service War yeah. Medal. Yeah. Who presented these to you? Nobody. They came in the post in a little cardboard box. <laughs> they came in a box? Yeah. yeah. Serious? Well, yeah, everybody had those. <clears throat> They're only general medals, like, you know. Wow. There we are. What do you think about that, ladies and gentlemen? He's got four medals. They came in a box. He was a rear gunner, <laughs> bomber command. <laughs> Expect the phone lines to light up now. <laughs> We're going to go to Gloria in Neath. We'll go to Liz in Merthyr Tidville. Hello, Liz. Hello, Gloria. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. Do you know, Gloria and Liz, I'm very lucky to have many people to come onto the programme and sit opposite many people and talk to their fascinating lives. But I tell you what, I am, I am so honoured today to be sat opposite Ted Davis, Gloria. Yeah, same as my uncle. He was, uh, my uncle was the tail gunner on the tour with the 103 squadron. Was he? With 103? That's my squadron. Well, he was 44 to 45. Yes. And he was uh, Thomas Quinlan. And he he was his um, commander, or what do you call them, the ones in charge of the plane? I'm not very good at this. A skipper. Yes. Captain. He was um, a Belgian. Vernon Ew or somebody. Oh, I can't say a name. And he um, was wanted by the Germans for, um, oh, because he'd done wrong then out there. He was in the underground. He and did right, he didn't do wrong. <laughs> yeah, but you know you what I mean. And uh, they couldn't call him by his proper name. But my uncle did um, 30 missions over. Good. Good. And it's only now the book has come out because he died about ten years ago. I did thirty, yeah. And um, he, uh, his uh, cousin, my, my cousin's his daughter, had to finish it through the archives because he hadn't finished it. What dates uh, in 1944 was he there at one or three? Do you know? Uh, oh, I did have it. I, I say I was in. The, I've only uh, completed his training in Blyton. In, in 1944. Yeah. Lancaster Finishing School, July 1944 in Helms, Helmswell. That's right. Um, 
103 Squadron. He, we arrived on the 28th of July in 1944. He was there the same time as me then? Yeah. He was only about... Uh, what did that make him? He was born in 28. So. Young. He was younger than me. And that's when he, that's when he got... Then, uh, nine, that's right, my mother was nine, no, 10 in life. My mother was 43, so that would make him about 45. So he was just about 19 getting in. The same age as me, yeah. Yeah. And he, that's at Elsham Walls. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah, and I'd say the book has just come out now. So... I, I got a book here now. It's called Black Swan. Have you got that one? No, he's named his book Corkscrew to Safety. Oh, I must uh, have a look for that. And he, I wondered what it meant, but after reading so many bits, you know, I've come, you know, it's just, I mean, over to get out of the way of the enemy aeroplanes, isn't it? Yeah, corkscrew. Yeah. If you can get a book called Black Swan, mm. it's the history of 103 Squadron during the Second World War. Oh, good. Yeah. And I tell you what, if you know his pilot's name, his, pr- his name is probably in there. Oh, good. But, you, you know, it's only just come out, and I thought... I've only just started reading it in the beginning about his early life. It was a bit um, boring, but now <laughs> what he's what he's been going through and what he's done, like I can't believe he's done it. There you, you are. know it's and for and then he's on about you know twenty squad twenty raids about the most, but you know he turned out he did thirty. Yeah, I did thirty. He did full, full well, top. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, you know, it's, Gloria, thank you very much indeed. It's very nice to talk to you. We'll go to Liz in Merthyr Tidville. Hello, Liz. Hi there. Hi. Your uncle was a flight engineer on the Lancasters. That's correct, yes. He's, he's still alive. He's 93. He's still alive? <laughs> yeah. Um, and one of your previous callers said that um, her father didn't talk about it, and my uncle didn't talk about it until about the last five years. Uh-huh. And he's, he's told us so much in that, in that time. Um, he's got a, a DFM, Distinguished Flying Medal. Good. And all his um, all his log books are still there. Yeah, yeah. it's absolutely fascinating. Why do you I mean, think he's a hero to us? Yeah, I, absolutely, no doubt. Well, listen, I've got this from Basil on Twitter who says, "Jace Ted is an absolute inspiration. Mm-hmm. What he's seen and lived through is incredible. What a guy." Says Basil. There you are. That's what people are saying about you, Ted. People are describing you as a hero as well on the on the text and on the email. Liz, I just want to ask you, given the fact that Ted has been so open about his experience, and we had. Our caller there saying that her father didn't talk about it. He was a prisoner of war. Why do you think your uncle changed his mind? Well, I, I think really it was um, the fact that we were all so interested and, and just kept asking and asking, and eventually he just opened up about it. And I don't know whether it's anything to do with his age as well. But um, well, people people should know about it. It's all, of course, yeah, yeah. I mean. We, as a child, well, as growing up, you know, you hear, you hear a lot about the war, but until you actually speak to someone who's been there and done it all, you don't understand what they went through. Mm. What, right. what I can't understand, Liz, as well, is that, you know, it's taken long enough for Bomber Command to be recognised with this memorial, but, Liz, I was shocked. Uh, you probably heard it in my voice. He's got these medals here mm. Ted has brought in, four medals... And our, my obvious question was, who presented these wonderful medals to you for your wonderful services? The post office. The post office. They came in a box. <laughs> yeah. My uncle's got medals, which is still in, in the cardboard box that they came in. Yeah. But uh, for the DFM, he did go to the palace and he was presented um, with his DFM by King George, I think. George VI, yeah. Yeah, yeah. His wife and um, his mother accompanied him to the palace. Good. So your uncle is 93, he was a flight engineer. What about yeah. the rest of the crew? Are they, have they all passed on now, Liz? Yes, they have. He's the last one. Yeah. Yeah, incredible gentleman. Yeah, incredible. Liz, great to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. You send your uncle our best wishes. Uh, this is from Lorna, who says, My dad, Goma Mumford, put the bombs on the Lancasters. S for sugar. He could tell us many stories. He would be very proud of the memorial. Robin Thetley, I say well done to the men of Bomber Command. They deserve all the praise we can give them for their courage and giving back to the Germans what they started. It is disgusting that they did not get a campaign medal. Let's go to Alan in Cardiff. Hi, Alan. Hello, I'm surprised but delighted by this because I didn't know I was going to be on the programme. My friend who alerted me to the fact it was coming on has evidently 
contacted you, but it's, of course, a great pleasure for me to be here with you now. Well, it's great to talk to you, Alan. Uh, listen, your experience of Bomber Command, tell us all about it. Well, I, I also uh, served uh, much on Bomber Command. I operated much the same time as Ted. Um, I was in the, uh, 1944 um, from very early on right through to the end of the war because my uh, pilot was made a squadron leader and uh, he had administrative duties, so we didn't fly quite as often as many of the crews. But in the end, um, I did 29 ops and the rest of the crew did 30. And the reason for, for the fact that they did 30 was that my first crew, and this is a point that isn't always taken into consideration, my first crew were all killed in the final stages of training. Uh, I wasn't on the flight because I'd had my appendix out the, the uh, week before. And, uh, and so I, I was left with, we put a, a memorial up in Yorkshire where they were killed, um, and we go up there every year at Armistice Sunday and we never forget them. How lucky uh, can you get? Then, uh, as a bomb member without a crew, and a crew who had done one operation, that's the big operation to Nuremberg, where 57 of our bombers was lost, uh, their bomb member was killed. So they needed a bomb member, and I needed a crew. Yeah. And they adopted me, and we d did a very successful time together with many hazards, but we came through just like Ted did. Yeah. And, yeah. Mm. And, uh, and because they, when they got to the 30th, which was the tour, I'd only done 29 the authorities granted me my tour on 29 Ops. So that, that's my story in a nutshell. Mm. Well, uh, Alan, Alan, I asked Ted this question. Did he think about the people that he was bombing below? At the time, I think you said, Ted, didn't you, that you were, you were just thinking about the your job in hand, yeah. your target, your yeah. country, fighting for your country. Uh, what about you, Alan? I mean, this is, this is the thing. I mean, it was a total war. Uh, like Ted said, um, we started off quite a pussy-putting around, actually, uh, if you look at the history of Bomb Command, yeah. trying not to bomb anything where anybody, civilian, might have died. Leaflets. But in the end, it turned out you couldn't do that. And, of course, when the bombing from Germany started, we couldn't just sit there and take it. And we know, I mean, in Cardiff, there were, uh, lots of people uh, lost their lives all over, all over the UK, in London, and very particularly in Coventry. Oh, you take many places... People were losing their lives because of indiscriminate bombing. And it was absolutely vital that we return that. Mm. And when people say you shouldn't have done all this, and when, like Ted said, some people used to call us murderers, I would say to them it was a total war against an absolutely atrocious regime, the Nazis. It had to be won. And if it wasn't won, if we hadn't won it, you would not be free to express the view that you've just given. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And, and that's the point. Freedom of speech would have gone. So many of our friends, um, for one reason or another, would have been put in gas chambers. The whole thing would have been just ghastly. Yeah. It Alan... Be won, and it was total war. And I, and I, like Ted, am glad to have made some contribution towards a, a vital victory. Well, Alan and, and Ted, what's been fascinating post the Bomber Command Memorial is that on the many television documentaries and the many books that have been written and articles is that historians are now saying if it wasn't for you and your bravery, Ted, let's start with you, that the Second World War would not have been won if it wasn't for Bomber Command. Oh, yeah, there was a lot to be said for that. And Churchill himself, of course, that's the only sad that Churchill was a wonderful war leader, absolutely fantastic. But it's very sad that because of uh, uh, party political reasons towards the end of the war, he seemed to turn his back on us, and that's why it's been such a long time since we got official recognition, yes. and we were the only ones not mentioned. Yeah. But in fact, if you look back at some of Churchill's speeches during the war, you will see that he placed upon Bomber Command, uh, he placed them as the one great hope we had for victory. And I think that's what we got in context. So I think the contribution by Baba Command was an enormous step towards the total victory that we ultimately won. Well, I, I did say it, the only force that could attack Germany for four years. There was no other force at that time that could take the war into Germany. That's right. Yes. 
Fantastic stuff. Like what Ted says, yeah. Fantastic stuff, Alan. Thank you very much indeed. This is from Chris on the text who says, we'll do a few texts here, Ted, so you can hear what people are saying about yeah. you and your achievements. This is from Chris. Please pass on my thank you, Jason, and admiration onto your guest, Ted. My dad was an airframe fitter in the war, patching up the Lancaster, made sure I understood your heroism. Filling up the holes, yeah. <laughs> Lee and Swansea, can you ask the gentleman what he thinks about the misuse of the term hero? We've done that one. This is from Maria, who calls in to say, thank you very much indeed to Ted from the bottom of her heart, because if it was not for you and people like you, we would not have the freedom we enjoy today. Kev says, Ted, thank you very much. I have no question for you, but I thank you with all my heart for the courage you showed and for setting Europe free. You are a living hero. Kerry, Ted, thank you and your mates for what you did in the war. All of you have kept us free. And this is from Bob. Jason, please ask your guest, if a Christian was bombing in an aeroplane over enemy land and its people therein, would his patriotism and nationalism neutralise his religious belief? P.S. I'm a Second World War fanatic. So I think what Bob is trying to say is, how do you square your conscience? My conscience is clear. Absolutely clear. Simple. Yeah. Are you a religious man, Ted? No. No. Bernard says, what an interesting and emotional story Ted Davis has to tell, and with such little reward. Why don't we have statues and streets named after people like him instead of the usual suspects, the politicians? If Ted had ridden a bike in the Olympics, he would have received a knighthood, says Bernard. <laughs> well said, Bernard. I, I think can't... that's the sentiment of everybody listening to this programme right now. I can't If imagine... Olympians can get knighted and get MBEs and CBEs for goodness knows what then Ted Davis of Ely, Cardiff, deserves something. I can't imagine Avenue Ted Davis. <laughs> Having what? I say I can't imagine Avenue Ted Davis. Avenue Ted Davis. <laughs> Ted Davis Street. <laughs> Sir Ted Davis has a ring to it, doesn't <laughs> it? <laughs> hey? I'll take that, yeah. <laughs> Are we allowed to start campaigns for these sort of things, Mr Producer? No. no. Yeah. <laughs> Ian says on Twitter, Jason, I have a lump in my throat listening to Ted on your show. He is a true hero. Another one says, our admiration for the gentleman in your studio, on your programme, now knows no bonds. Incredible bravery. And like him, God bless them all. Paul says, I'm going to miss your item as I'm overseas, but maybe you should ask Ted what he thinks about the country he risked his life for now, especially the BBC. Looking at our country now, where politicians think flack is mild criticism, not hot metal fragments. Ted, would you risk your life again? If necessary, yes. You'd do it all again? I would. I, I wouldn't have missed doing what I did, not for the world. You know, Ted, you've come into the, onto the programme. You called this show when we talked about Bomber Command and the memorial and the controversy. There were people who were saying that it's not right that we're celebrating the deaths, basically, of 300,000 to 600,000 civilians. That was the debate on that day. But it remains a very difficult legacy for some veterans to talk about. Can you understand why so many of your mates close up and don't talk about it? I, I can't understand it because uh, when you consider the regime that killed millions of people, uh, 300,000 in a country of many millions is really nothing. <clears throat> I mean, uh, there were 50, as I said, 56,000 air crew, bomber command air crew mm. killed. But there were 600,000 civilians in Germany killed. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It's... Uh, it's but that's war. but that's war. It's, it's total war, as Alan says. Total war. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. If they could have shot me down, they would have. Mm. Mm. But thankfully, you're here to tell the tale. I am. I'm a survivor. Do you go into schools, Ted, and talk about your experience? No. No, I've never been. Would there. you, if you were invited? I, I did during the war. I went to my old school. I left school at 14. Mm. And uh, when I was on leave once, I met a teacher there, and he asked me if I'd go in... Have a little talk. With mm. But don't you think young children today should be taught about they what should... happened in the Second World War? And, and you, imagine you going into a school and telling your story. Indeed. Would you do that? I would. If invited? If, if invited, I'd do it, yes. Yeah. Show them that war is not, uh, what, what shall I say, uh, a nice, nowhere near mm. a nice thing. No. You had children. You have children. I've got, got one son now, yeah. Yeah. You also had a bit of personal tragedy. Yeah, I lost one son at 11, 11 years of age with leukaemia, yeah. Yeah. 
but that was back in 1958. Yeah. Yeah. There we are. What about your wife? Uh, unfortunately, she's in a care home now. Right. Yeah. Do you still have family and, and friends around you, Ted? Oh, yeah. I live on my own now, but, uh, yeah, I'm all right. I mm. go to the club now and again and have a pint. And yeah, have a pint. Again. Enjoy yeah. yourself. Yeah. Got mates still around. Yeah. Let's go to Heidi. Hello, Heidi. Hello. Hi. Um, yes, I, I just happened to uh, listen to this programme. I know my husband listened to it, but he went, he had to go out. And um, um, I remember my, my husband is English, I'm German. And uh, my husband's father was, in the, was one of the bomber crews. He was the um, um, navigator. <laughs> and he bombed Stuttgart, which is my hometown. Yeah. And um, a, a short while ago, my husband and my daughter went to do a bit of um, um, work on um, genealogy, you know, yep. and went to the war records. And there it said, um, we've bombed Stuttgart on the 26th of July, 1944. Um, you know, Stuttgart is, is a blaze, you know, Stuttgart is flat. And my husband came back hardly dare tell me, and he said, when was your parents' house bombed? And uh, my sister could tell me that it was the 26th of July, 1944. So he may have been instrumental in bombing my parents' house, which is quite an eerie mm-hmm. thought, isn't it? But it's total war, Heidi, as some oh, of yes. our contributors oh, yes. have said. I mean, you know, we, we, we accept <laughs> that. And uh, he, he was talking about the Germans... You know, when his mother, his, his wife once said, oh, I hate the Germans when they were, you know, bombing uh, when he, in England here. Mm. And he said, no, don't say that. They don't want this war any, war, any more than we do. Mm. They have been given orders. We've been given orders. We, have to, we are doing the same to them. Ted, what do and you say to Heidi? It was a wonderful thing to say, really. I and sh- when my husband got engaged to me, people stopped his mo- mother in the road saying, how mm. can you accept that your husband... Your fa- son is now marrying a German after all you've been through because he was killed. I got nothing against uh, the Germans no. today. The no, only... no, 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 no. But, you know, it is a very strange situation to be in. Can you Absolutely, imagine? Absolutely, yes, I can imagine. Of course. Yes. Yeah. You can imagine, Ted, as well. Yeah, with the Nazi regime, it was um, totally different. Yeah. It, it had to be stopped, and the only way we could attack Germany was from the air at the time. Yes, yes. Um, so, uh, I don't know whether it was you or somebody who said earlier that, you know, you, you had to win the war. You know, that was the only way to stop Hitler. Yeah. And uh, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I think it's horrendous what Hitler has done. And a lot of Germans are very ashamed of what Hitler has done. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm very glad English people won the war so that, you know, it has solved the problem that we, as you say... We are all free now. Yes. Uh, so it's 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 marvelous what what everybody has done. But I'm, you know, I'm glad I'm very... glad it, I did the job and uh, that it finished the right way anyway. Ted, it's been a great pleasure having you on the program. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. You've certainly, I think, made a big impression and on not, our listeners today. We've had a number of people saying they've got lumps in their throat listening to the story one, of your bravery. Not and one courage. adverse. Not one adverse comment. Of course not, no. no. Why would there be? Because Did they you call... expect there to be? Well, some, some people call us murderers, don't they? Yeah. yeah. But you've come into the studio, you've spoken so openly and Good. eloquently. Good. You've done a fantastic job. Thank you. Keep in touch with us. I will. Sir Ted Davis, the campaign <laughs> starts now. <laughs>